can we uh can we just step back a little bit sure. this infinity crisis led to a kind of uh rebuilding of mathematics so uh it would be nice if you lay out the things that resulted in so one is set theory became the foundation of mathematics all mathematics could not be built from sets giving math its first truly rigorous foundation the axiomatization of mathematics the paradox is forced mathematicians to develop zfc and other axiomatic systems and uh, mathematical logic emerged uh, Gerdo, turing and others created entire new fields so can you uh, explain what set theory is and uh, how does it serve as a foundation of uh, modern mathematics and maybe even the foundation of truth? That's a great question. Set theory really has two roles that it's serving. This kind of two ways that set theory emerges. On the one hand, set theory is, the, is its own subject of mathematics which, with its own problems and questions and answers and proof methods. And so... Really, from this point of view, set theory is about the transfinite recursive constructions or well-founded definitions and constructions. And those ideas have been enormously fruitful, and set theorists have looked into them and developed uh, so many ideas coming out of that. But set theory has also happened to serve in this other foundational role, it's very common to hear things said about set theory that really aren't taking account of this distinction between the two roles that it's serving. It's its own subject, but it's also serving as a foundation of mathematics. So in its foundational role, set theory provides a way to think of a collection of things as one thing. That's the, the central idea of set theory. A set is a collection of things, but you think of the set itself as one abstract thing. So it, when you form the set of real numbers, then that is a set. It's one thing. It's a set, and the, it has elements inside of it. So it's sort of like a bag of objects. A set is kind of like a bag of objects. And so we have a lot of different axioms that uh, describe the nature of this idea of thinking of a collection of things as, as one thing itself, one abstract thing. And axioms are, I guess, facts that we assume are true based on which we then build the ideas of mathematics. So there's a bunch of facts, axioms about sets that we can put together. And if they're sufficiently powerful, we can then build on top of that a lot of really interesting mathematics. Yeah, I think that's right. So, I mean, the history of how of the current set theory axioms known as the zermelo frankel axioms uh, came out in the early 20th century with, with Zermelo's idea. I mean, the history is quite fascinating because um, Zermelo in 1904 offered a proof that the what's called the axiom of choice implies the well-order principle. So he described his proof, and that was extremely controversial at the time. And there was no theory. There weren't any axioms there. Cantor was not working in an axiomatic framework. He didn't have a list of axioms in the way that we have for set theory now. And Zermelo didn't either. Um, and his ideas were challenged so much with regard to the well-order theorem mm -hmm. uh, that he was pressed to produce the theory that in which his argument could be formalized, and that was the origin of what's known as Zermelo set theory. Uh, and going to perplexity, the axiom of choice is a fundamental principle in set theory which states that for any collection of non-empty sets, it is possible to select exactly one element from each set, even if no explicit rule to make the choice is given. This axiom allows the construction of a new set containing one element from each original set, even in cases where the collection is infinite or where there is no natural way to specify a selection rule. So this was controversial, and uh, this was described before there was even a language for axiomatic systems. That's right. So on the one hand, I mean, the axiom of choice principle is completely obvious that we want this to be true, that it is true. I mean, a lot of people take it as a law of logic. If you have a bunch of sets, then there's a way of picking an element from each of them. There's a function, if I have a bunch of sets, then there's a function that uh, when you apply it to any one of those sets gives you an element of that set. It's it's a completely natural principle. I mean, it's called the axiom of choice, which is a way of sort of 
anthropomorphizing the mathematical idea. It's not like the function is choosing something. I mean, it's just that if you were to make such choices, there would be a function that consisted of the choices that you made. And the difficulty is that when you when you can't specify a rule or a procedure by which you're making choices, then it's difficult to say what the function is that you're asserting exists. You know, you, you, you want to have the view that well, there is a way of choosing. I don't have an easy way to say what the function is, but there definitely is one. Yeah, this is the way of thinking about the excellent choice. So we're going to say the, the the three letters of ZFC may be a lot in this conversation. You already mentioned Zermelo right. Frankel set theory. That's the Z and the F, and the C in that is this comes from this axiom of choice. That's right. So ZFC sounds like a super technical thing, but it is the set of axioms that's the foundation of modern mathematics. Yeah, absolutely. So one should be aware also that there's huge parts of mathematics that don't, that pay attention to whether the excellent choice is being used and they don't want to use the excellent choice or they work out the consequences that are possible without the excellent choice or with weakened forms of of Zermelo Frankel set theory and so on. And that's quite a, there's quite a vibrant amount of work in that area. I mean, but going back to the excellent choice for a bit, it's maybe, uh, interesting to to give Russell's description of how to think about the axiom of choice. So Russell describes um, this uh, rich person who has a, an infinite closet, and in that closet he has infinitely many pairs of shoes. And he tells his butler uh, to, uh, please go and give me one shoe from each pair. And and the butler can do this easily because he can, for any pair of shoes, he can just always pick the left shoe. I mean, there's a way of picking that we can describe. We always take the left one or always take the right one or take the left one if it's a red shoe and the right one if it's a brown shoe or, you know, we can invent rules that would result in these kind of choice functions. So we can describe explicit choice functions. And for those cases, you don't need the axiom of choice to know that there's a choice function. When you can describe a specific way of choosing, then you don't need to appeal to the axiom to know that there's a choice function. But the problematic case occurs when you think about the infinite collection of socks that the person has in their closet. And if we assume that socks are sort of indistinguishable within each pair, you know, they match each other, but they're sort of, you know, indiscernible, then the the butler wouldn't have any kind of rule for which sock in each pair to pick. And so it's not so clear that he has a way of, of producing one sock from each pair because, right, so that's what's at stake is the question of whether you can specify a rule by which the choice function, you know, a rule that it obeys uh, that defines the choice function, or whether there's sort of this arbitrary choosing aspect to it. That's when you need the axiom of choice to know that there is such a function. But of course, as a matter of mathematical ontology, we might find attractive the idea that, well, look, I mean, I don't, I don't, not every way of choosing the socks has to be defined by a rule. Why should everything that exists in mathematical reality follow a rule or a procedure of that sort? If I have the idea that my mathematical ontology is rich with objects, then I think that that there are all kinds of functions and ways of choosing. Those are all part of the mathematical reality that I want to be talking about. And so I don't have any problem asserting the axiom of choice. Yes, there is a way of choosing, um, but I can't te- necessarily tell you what it is. But in a mathematical argument, I can assume that I fix the choice function because I know that there is one. So it's a, the philosophical difference between working when you have the axiom of choice and when you don't is the question of this constructive nature of the argument. So if you make an argument and you appeal to the axiom of choice, then maybe you're admitting that the objects that you're producing in the proof are not going to be constructive. You're not going to be able to necessarily say specific things about them. But if you're just claiming to make an existence claim, that's totally fine. Whereas if you have a constructive attitude about the nature of mathematics, and you think that mathematical claims maybe are only warranted when you can provide an explicit procedure for producing the mathematical objects that you're dealing with, uh, then 
you're probably going to want to deny the axiom of choice and maybe much more. Can we maybe speak to the axioms that uh, underlies ESC? So going to perplexity is ESC, or as Amelia Frankel said, theory with the axiom of choice, as we mentioned, is the standard foundation for most modern mathematics. It consists of the following main axioms, axiom of extensionality, axiom of empty set, axiom of pairing, axiom of union, axiom of power set, axiom of infinity, axiom of separation, axiom of replacement, axiom of regularity, and axiom of choice. Uh, some of these are quite basic, um, but it would be nice to kind of give people a sense sure. of what it means to be an axiom, like what kind of basic facts we can lay on the table on which we can build some beautiful mathematics. Yeah, so the history of it is really quite fascinating. So Zermelo introduced most of these axioms, I mean, as part of what's now called Zermelo set theory, to formalize his proof from the axiom of choice to the well-order principle, which was an extremely controversial result. So in 1904, he gave the proof without the theory, and then it was challenged to provide the theory. And so in 1908, he produced the Zermelo set theory and gave the proof that in that theory, you can prove that every set admits a well-ordering. Um, and so the axioms on the list, these things like extensionality, express the, the most fundamental principles of the understanding of sets that he wanted to be talking about. So, for example, extensionality says if two sets have the same members, then they're equal. So it's this idea that the sets consist of the collection of their members, and that's it. There's nothing else that's going on in this set. So it's just if, if two sets have the same members, then they are the same set. So it's maybe the most primitive uh, axiom uh, in some respect. Well, there's also, just to give a flavor, uh, there exists a set with no elements called the empty set. Uh, for any two sets, there's a set that contains exactly those two sets as elements. For any set, there's a set that contains exactly the elements of the elements of that set, so the union set. And then there's the power set. For any set, there's a set whose elements are exactly the subsets of the original set, the power set. And the axiom of infinity, there exists an infinite set, typically a set that contains the empty set and is closed under the operation of adding one more element. Back to our hotel example. That's right. And there's there's more, but this it's kind of fascinating. Um, I used to put yourself in the mindset of people at the beginning of this, of trying to formalize set theory. It's, it's fascinating that humans can do that. I read some historical accounts by historians about that time period, specifically about Zermelo's axioms and his proof of the well-order theorem. And the historians were saying, um, Never before in the history of mathematics has a mathematical theorem been argued about so publicly and so vociferously uh, as that theorem of Zermelo's. Um, and it's fascinating also because the axiom of choice was widely regarded as a kind of you know basic principle at first, but then when but people were very suspicious of the well-order theorem because no one could imagine a well-ordering, say, of the real numbers. And so th this was a case when Zermelo seemed to be, from principles that seemed quite reasonable, proving this obvious untruth. And so people were, mathematicians were objecting. Um, but then Zermelo and others actually looked into the mathematical papers and so on of some of the people who had been objecting so vociferously and found in many cases, that they were implicitly using the axiom of choice in their own arguments, even though they would argue publicly against it, because it's so natural to use it because it's such an obvious principle in a way. I mean, it's easy to just use it by accident with if you're not critical enough and you don't even realize that you're using the axiom of choice. That, that's true now even. People like to pay attention to when the axiom of choice is used or not used in mathematical arguments, I mean, up until this day. It used to be more important in the early 20th century. It was very important because people didn't know if it was a consistent theory or not, and there were these antinomies arising, and so there was a worry about consistency of the axioms. Um, but then, of course, eventually, with the result of 
of Gödel and Cohen and so on, the, this consistency question specifically about the axiom of choice sort of falls away. We know that it, the axiom of choice itself will never be the source of inconsistency in set theory. If there's inconsistency with the axiom of choice, then it's it's already inconsistent without the axiom of choice. So it's not the cause of inconsistency. And so in that from that point of view, the need to pay attention to whether you're using it or not from a consistency point of view is somehow less important. But still, there's this uh, reason to pay attention to it on the grounds of these uh, constructivist ideas that I had mentioned earlier. And we should say, in set theory, consistency means that it is impossible to derive a contradiction from the axioms of the theory. So means that there's no contradictions. That's that's a, that's right. a consistent axiomatic system that there's no contradictions. A consistent theory is one for which you cannot prove a contradiction from that theory.